The Cats humble the Swans in the grand final replay. Charlie Cameron kicks seven in the nation's capital and the Dockers get rocked by the Lobster and the Western Bulldogs. This is The Round So Far, brought to you by Amy. This is The Round So Far, brought to you by Amy. I am Riley Beveridge. This is Kane Coins. Kane, we're back in the studio, back from South Australia last week. Short week of footy so far. We'll dive straight into it at GMHBA Stadium, where Geelong inflicted Sydney's worst defeat since 1998 in the grand final rematch. Speaking of back, the Cats are back, and those who wrote them off are going to be made to look a little bit foolish. This was the opening quarter blitz, and... They just went bang right from the start. They had the game in their control from minute one until minute 120. So it was three, six goals to two in the first quarter and some of their really good players got back into form, including Tom Hawkins with five, mm. Jeremy Cameron there with five also. Ten between those two. Patrick Dangerfield was enormous. Their hunger, their hunt, their pressure was back. Their tackling was ferocious. They still got eight games left at GMHBA yeah. where they do not lose. <laughs> Signs are ominous and how quickly things can turn within a season for Chris Scott and Geelong. This was so similar to last year's grand final in more ways than one. Geelong absolutely smashed Sydney in just about every facet of the game. Nightmares, they? isn't it? So it's so, so many similarities, and we'll get to some more shortly, but plus 91 disposals, inside 50s in the grand final, you can compare the two games. When Sydney lose, mm. they often lose around the footy and they get beaten up in contested possessions. Whether they're big enough through the midfield, I'm not sure. There's a lot of smaller bodies that go through there. Tonight they were smashed in stoppage. They were smashed there in the grand final. And, and there's the full four-quarter performance yeah. that you've seen from the grand final, the big one, where mm. Sydney were embarrassed. And as you said, their biggest loss in a long, long time. Biggest loss for John Longmire as coach. And that was how it was done today. And look at that third quarter, 44-1, to one, an absolute drubbing. You question whether or not Sydney had enough big-bodied midfielders. One of their best in Callum Mills started the game on Tom Hawkins down back. Tom Hawkins kicked five. Was it the right move? Well, I'm not sure what else you could have done. I mean, mm. they've been decimated with their key defenders. Both McCartans are out, Rampy is out, but he was just on tonight. And when the ball comes in with a lack of pressure, and that frequently, I mean, mm. there's not a lot that Mills can do. They did change the matchup after half time. Aaron Francis was playing in the forward line, but I'm not sure he would have been capable of stopping Tom Hawkins either. So, I mean, they, they were in trouble right from the start yep. and, and Geelong took that many marks inside 50. It wasn't funny tonight. And their aerial dominance, as we're seeing here, and Hawkins was on the end of some terrific ball use. And they managed him really well. I was really worried about how he started the season, Tom yep. Hawkins, after no pre-season. He looked dreadful. Like, his movement was, was lost. So they've managed him into the season and allowed him to play himself back into form rather than train himself back into form. And it's a sign of how well Chris Scott and the medical team at the Cats know their players. Five more for Jeremy Cameron tonight. He's got 27 through six games Is at a quarter of the way through the season. I reckon he might. If really? He playing like this, he, I think he will. He's a quarter of the way there already, we're a quarter of the way through the season. One extra game this year as well, don't forget. What do you reckon? Yeah, yeah I, I think it will be a struggle when, mm. when the rain comes, when winter sets in. And <laughs> what Geelong do is manage their veteran players, and he's in that yeah. category now. So I don't suspect he'll play all the games, they're much more worried about winning back-to-back -back premierships and Jeremy Cameron kicking 100. Might get four extra games this year, though, if they make the grand final again as well. We'll head to Monica Oval now, and this is where we find our Saturday star. It can be none other than Charlie Cameron today. A career-high seven goals to go with 15 disposals and six marks. He's probably, for me, the most watchable. I mean, Papley was pretty watchable mm. last week, but the excitement levels, any time this man goes near the football, he's a nightmare matchup. As soon as the ball hits the ground. He just wins that many one-on-one -on -one contests. And speaking of nightmares, Connor Iden is going to have nightmares about this. And he was just on from the start. I mean, Canelio's tackle there was awful, but he played with the physical presence. He's counting his goals with his hands there. <laughs> He's must-watch. He's a great celebrator. And really, he was the difference in the game. Yeah. Like, if he doesn't play for Brisbane today, they, they probably lose that game because mm. the Giants 
didn't disgrace himself in the contest. So Charlie gets the Sunday star. He also gets the moment because we'll debate this. I reckon this is intentional and I reckon this is the goal of the year from Charlie Cameron. You reckon he meant this? I reckon he meant no, it. Look at his head. No chance. His head is on a swivel. This is a he's looking at the goals. This Charlie Cameron knows exactly what he's doing in any <laughs> moment. He could have easily picked the ball up. He just jumped because he thought the ball was going to oh. bounce up into his head. Luckily, that is struck the outside of his boot. That is a fluke, and that cannot be goal of the year. I reckon that wins it. I reckon his head looks over at the goals as soon as it happens. I reckon he meant it. I reckon I'm, that's goal of the year. I'm going with the coach. Chris Fagan said it was a fluke at halftime. <laughs> All right, well, it was an interesting game because, as you said, the Lions won, but the Giants had nearly 100 more disposals for the game. This is the top seven ball winners on the ground. Only one line, and it's Daniel Rich. Bit of junk there, isn't it? I mean, because you look at the, the efficiency... Um, that Brisbane were able to play with. Kelly had big numbers. Dunkley mm. went to him after half time and quelled his influence a little bit, but he stood it up with 41. Cornelio had big numbers across the board, so not just disposals, clearances. Uh, and then Haynes across half back. Rich was the only line in that group that you mentioned. Mm. Whitfield's having a poor season. He was ineffective, and I thought Toby Green tried his heart out, but a lot of those numbers were junk. It's Lockie Neal's lowest average disposals at this point of a season since 2014. They've obviously brought in Josh Dunkley and Will Ashcroft comes into the midfield as well. But do you think he's having more of an impact with less of the ball? Yeah, I don't mind it. I don't mm. mind that, that um, they've got more numbers ro rotating through, as you mentioned, Ashcroft and Dunkley come in. Bailey's spending a bit more time yeah. inside. I hope Moreno gets some more minutes inside because I think he can be deadly in that aspect of the game as well. And you don't want to be reliant on Lockie Neal. It's not dissimilar to Collingwood. Tom Mitchell comes in, yeah. doesn't average massive numbers mm. like he did at Hawthorne, but has more impact with the numbers that he's getting. We'll head to our Amy Clangers now. Who covers Clangers? Amy does. Kane, coaching is a stressful business. Adam Kingsley, first-year coach, he's looked stressed so far this yep. season. He found a way to combat it today. Well, though. He did. He's got the, <laughs> the stress ball out because he was ready to be punching holes in walls, and there he is today. So, look, we can laugh about this, but I think it's good um, work from the Giants. He clearly needed some help in that area. He needed a mentor. Otherwise, it's going to be too demanding on mm. him, and he's not going to be able to cope psychologically with the stresses of coaching. So for someone to pull him inside and say, hey, look, have you noticed this? Yeah. How about we do this to help you? Mm. And he was much more calm and composed at critical stages in the box today from what we saw on camera anyway. Yeah, well, I like it. Well, Amy Clangers for good is back for the 2023 season. Amy is donating $10 to Community Footy for every clanger recorded over selected rounds with eight lucky local clubs across the season, taking home up to $15,000 each. To put your club in the running, head to afl.com.au forward slash clangers for good and tell us what the clangers a donation would mean for your local club and footy community. Kane, we'll head to Optus Stadium now, Friday night footy, where the Bulldogs got the job done over Fremantle. It was convincing and it was their captain leading the way. Oh, he's just been unbelievable. Like, what a season he's put together. He's like, he's full season, but his last month has just been extraordinary. And this is as good a game as you're ever going to see from a midfielder. His ball use, like, we've seen the numbers that the GWS players put up today. Every one of his touches is almost effective. He's a beautiful kick, he's in traffic, he's outside, he's pushing forward for the two goals, he's got a lead endurance and, you know, with two players hanging off him to find Trelaw there for the goal assist was enormous. But for the first time, it's all clicked for the Western Bulldogs. Like, look at this mark here, this is late in the game, mm. Montepelli goes forward and sits on head. So he's a freak, but I just thought the Western Bulldogs' talent finally coming together. Yeah. Their, their talent is just star-studded mm. and they can compete with anyone on that level but they haven't maximised that yet. Well, they did on Friday night and the result was devastating. A lot of the build-up in the lead-up to this game was about Rory Lobb. How did you make of how Fremantle went about it, his return to Western Australia? Well, it's embarrassing when the result is as it finishes. Like, this is all well and good. You want to do this before the start of the game. Lucky mm. not to give away a free kick here uh, with Clark. He chucks him to the ground. But then when the footy's there, you've got to actually win it. Now, he didn't have a massive night. Rory Lobb here, he goes back and kicks his only goal of the night in the second quarter, and he loved it. He had some clangers where he kicked into the man on the mark and missed some easier shots and, and made some errors and had some turnovers. Those Fremantle fans couldn't even watch. I wouldn't blame them, because mm. Fremantle are an awful team to watch in every aspect now. They've always been good defensively. We'll show some numbers in a second how they've lost that, and then they can't move the footy mm. at all. 
and they're in a bit of trouble, Frio. Now, in terms of a slider for the year, they're looking likely to drop way down the ladder. For all of the energy they expended on Rory Lobb, I found this bit of play absolutely staggering. Now, look where the ball goes. It goes here to Jamara Eugle Hagen. We can see it from behind the goals. Rory Lobb's not even in picture there, but have a look. There's one Fremantle player having a crack at Rory Lobb. There's two Fremantle players. Jago Amira makes it three and four here. Brennan Cox comes over. Luke Jackson goes over. There's six Fremantle players as Jamari Ugal Hagen is taking a shot for goal. He's lacing his boots at the moment. But as the shot comes in, we'll pause it in a second there. Six Fremantle players who have gone to Rory Lobb. They're all now backs to the play, out of position. Jamari Ugal Hagen takes a quick shot. There's Adam Trelaw. He's watched his players, his defenders, go over there and take take on Rory Lobb while he's completely free. This is an 18-point game at this stage of the game. Trelaw kicks a goal completely uncontested. It makes it 24 points just before three-quarter time, and it just about ties up the result. Yeah, so that's the embarrassment yeah. behind it. And Justin Longmuir can say after the game that it wasn't the difference in the game, but I bet you we hadn't seen that footage mm. there. That, that's a lack of leadership from the captain, Pierce and from all those around them. It's a lack of awareness. It's getting ahead of yourself. Uh, it, it's a selfish way to play football that you want to get under the skin of a former teammate that you clearly don't like mm. anymore. But it costs you in big moments. And, yeah, they've got real issues. The other issue they've got is that Luke Jackson and Darcy have been ineffective and that recruitment looks even worse because if Fremantle finished down the bottom of the ladder, mm. Melbourne possessed that first pick yeah. that they gave up for Jackson as well as 13 and a pick in the early 20s as well. So if this continues and they keep losing, Melbourne are going to be laughing and it's going to go down as a, a really average trade, particularly with the way Luke Jackson is playing zero touches in the last quarter again. Well, what Freeman have could hang their hats on in the last couple of years was their good back line, but they can't even get that right this year. That's a real worry for them, these scores that we've got on the board. Yeah, here. so they're always really strong defensively, or certainly, you know, in the last couple of years mm. under Justin Longmuir. So that, that was it there, 2022. Scores against turnovers, second in the comp, now 13th. Points conceded just, just in total. We know the teams that win premierships are really good defensively. Yeah. Second last year at 68, an extra 20 points this year, mm. 13th. And the problem with that is they can't score themselves. And yeah. their ball movement is so stagnant, it's wide, they can't get any fluency. Their forward line is ineffective with personnel and as a result of the movement. So, yeah, they've got a lot of concerns. Well, amid the struggles, Justin Longmuir has been coaching from the bench. This is what he had to say about why he's doing it. Having a senior coach down there allows us to be... allows us to... our younger players and all our players to some degree to reset. Um, stay involved in the game rather than getting caught up in mistakes and, and that type of thing. And I get a good sense of you know, leadership and um, you know, who comes to the bench a bit fired up and you know, who's, who's communicating with their teammates and um, staying in the game. So it's been a good exper exp uh, experiment. And um, yeah, I'll just work out week to week what I do. I'm not sure it's been a good experiment and mm. I don't expect it will last much longer. Justin Longmuir is a technical coach. That has been his strength. He sees it from the game. Mm. He sees it from the box. He can't see it from the bench. Now, the camera crossed to him 14 times. 12 times he's doing nothing. So there's a lot of this. There's standing in the back of the box. You're not talking to his players there. Mm. He's not a motivating coach. You hear him talk and, you know, it's very monotone and he's not a coach that's going to have you running through brick walls like Craig McRae or Ken Hinckley. This is the sort of stuff that he did. He needs to be back up in the box. It's not a copycat coaching league. You don't have to copy what Craig McRae and others are doing. So get back upstairs where you can see the game because largely he is ineffective mm. on game day when he's sitting in the second row of the dugout. We'll head to the Adelaide Oval now where Port Adelaide, Port Adelaide got the job done over West Coast. Third straight win and they're four and two all of a sudden. And this was the difference. So it was the second quarter here where it was a power surge, really, pardon the pun, six goals <laughs> to one and the rest of the game was relatively even. Darcy Byrne-Jones has been moved forward, mm -hmm. uh, kicked a couple today and is having an impact. Finlayson was the most dangerous forward on the ground. He kicked five. Luke Shuey just a, a woeful turnover from a captain running around the back for a cheap one turnover and Willie Rioli gets the goal against his former side from from the turnover and Zach Butters was really good with his ball use going inside. So they didn't shoot the lights out. I didn't think Port Adelaide today, they've got a few issues with personnel and also with injuries. And mm. I thought it was a sloppy second half. They only yeah. just won the second half, but all in all, they've won their last three against good opponents, Sydney in Sydney, the Western Bulldogs last week 
and uh, the West Coast Eagles at home. St Kilda yep. on Friday night presents yeah, a much stronger challenge coming up this weekend. You mentioned Port Adelaide getting the job done in second quarters. West Coast have had issues with second quarters as well. Connor Rosie won his second straight Peter Babco VC medal. He was awesome again today. So we could have highlighted the, the stuff on the outside, like a bit of this stuff where, you know, the agility is as good as anyone in the competition. Like, he's turning into a genuine top ten player in the league now. That's how good he has become. Mm. But this is what we noticed. So this is the grunt work that he has improved in his game. Last yeah. year, early on, he was questioned for his resilience and I guess a little bit of his toughness. Well, he heeded that message and this is the sort of stuff he's doing inside. Laid a lot of tackles today. I think he laid seven tackles high inside 50 count. So his disposals are maximum damage with his score involvements. His metres gained. He's tackling now, um, but also where he wins his possessions. So, yeah, big numbers across the board. Eight score involvements, seven tackles. Couple of um, couple of goals, and he's kicked goals in five out of the six games. It went from bad to worse for West Coast. Their captain Luke Shuey subbed off with an ankle injury. Fifteen players now, Kane, mm. on the injury list for West Coast. Couldn't even fit it on one page. We're going to have to go across two pages. They got beaten by 170 points in the waffle. Their reserve side last week. It's not looking. What do you expect, picture. though? This, this is the thing. So McGovern is always injured. So we look at the experience on the injury list. Well, I'm not really surprised. McGovern always gets injured. Nat Nui always gets injured. Shuey always gets injured. Yo never plays. So mm. um, we can look at the amount of experience on the injury list all you like. But at what point do we question their list management for keeping contracting these players? And Hearn's another one, and, and you know denying the rebuild that needed to happen three years ago, and also their sports science department. So you've got to have a real hard review of list management. What have we done? Why do we keep recontracting players that never play? Uh, and, and also the sports science department who yeah. can't get these guys on the park. Tom Jonas might be in a bit of MRO trouble for this bump on Jai Cully. Head-to-head -head contact, but if you choose to bump, it doesn't matter where the collision takes place. Oh, I'm sympathetic to him. I, mm. I really am because uh, he held onto the ball, Cully, there for a long time. Jonas has come in. He's realised he can't get there, so he's almost protecting himself as well. The bump wasn't high. Mm. The head clash was accidental. Yeah. Cully goes off. Thankfully came back on and yeah. had a big influence, kicked four goals in the game, but you are right. I, I can't argue with you that yeah. he's not going to be looked at and probably miss a week, but it's not to say it's not really difficult and we haven't made the game near on impossible for players who find themselves in that situation. Well, Kane, plenty more footy to get to in round six. We'll analyse it all right after this. The AFL Live app is the home of footy. All the stats, highlights, live scores and more, all in one place, the Match Centre. Keep an eye on every game. Footy was back with a bang. They, they just had no answers on the weekend. Get your daily footy fix. Welcome to Gettable. This is your one-stop shop for trade, draft and free agency. The AFL Live app is where you can watch your favourite shows. Wherever and whenever you want. The AFL Live app is everything you need to connect with our game. When you're younger, you train for a sport. When you're older, you train for the rest of your life. Download the AFL Live app now and never miss a moment. Kane, there is plenty more footy to get to in round six. Three games on Sunday, probably headlined by Carlton's clash against St Kilda. Goldie's 300 on the Gold Coast for North Melbourne. And then two massive games to finish off the weekend. The Anzac Day Eve clash. Melbourne and Richmond both coming off losses. And Collingwood and Essendon on Anzac Day. That's where we'll find our Kane's question for this week. I want to ask you, Kane, <laughs> with, the, with both Collingwood and Essendon in the top four together for the first time on Anzac Day, for the first time since 2000, is it the biggest Anzac Day match this century? Oh, it's a question without notice <laughs> and not one I'd given any thought to. So I'll just... I'll say yes, yeah. but how good is it to see Essendon flying? What a win against Melbourne last week and love the way that Collingwood play their football. I suspect they will be too strong, but not without their injuries as well, mm. particularly in the ruck. And noticed Essendon have gone a bit taller with yeah. selection to try and test them in that department. So they will present their challenges for the Pies, but you'd think they'll be too good. Well, Kane, you've been fantastic as always. Thanks, Thanks for you. joining us and we'll see you next week on The Round So Far.